In this video, we'll be going through the 2021 Level 1 Mechanics paper. Question 1. Zoe is snowboard racing in the mountains. The distance time graph below shows Zoe's race. Describe the motion of Zoe in the four sections. The key thing to remember here is that on a distance time graph, the slope is the speed. And so in section A here, we see that the slope is curved, that it's starting out gentle and it's getting steeper and steeper. The fact that the slope is getting steeper means that the speed is increasing, which means that Zoe is accelerating. In section B, we see that the slope is continuous. It does not change for the entire section. If the slope isn't changing, that means the speed isn't changing. In section C, we see the slope starts off relatively steep and then eventually gets gentler and gentler. If the slope is decreasing, that means the speed is decreasing, which means that Zoe is decelerating. In section D, we see that the line is flat, which means that the slope is zero. If the slope is zero, that means that the speed is zero, which means that Zoe is stationary. Question B. How long does Zoe's total journey take? And so we see that Zoe's journey starts at zero seconds, and the time at which Zoe finally comes to a stop is right here. And that time right there is 240 seconds. Question C. Calculate the speed of Zoe in section B. To calculate the speed, we need to know the change in distance and also the change in time. So we can see our time starts at 40 seconds and finishes at 220 seconds. That gives us a change in time of 180 seconds. As for our distance, we see that that starts at 300 meters and finishes at 2,200 meters. That gives us a distance of 1,900 meters. Our speed is equal to our distance divided by our time, which is 1,900 divided by 180, which gives me 10.56 meters per second to four significant figures. Question D. Another race is 3,000 meters long. Zoe averaged a speed of 5 meters per second. Calculate the time it would take for her to finish the race. And so we have her change in distance and we also have her velocity. What we're trying to find is her time. To do that, we need the equation we used above. Velocity equals distance over time, but we need to solve this for time. We can do that by swapping our V and T around, which gives us time equals distance over velocity which is 3,000 divided by 5, which gives 600 seconds. To get back to her car, Zoe wears snowshoes. The surface area of one snowshoe is 0.15 meter square, and the surface area of one walking shoe is 0.3 meter square. Zoe has a weight of 570 newtons. Calculate the pressure on the snow for one snowshoe and also one walking shoe. Pressure is given by our equation up here, which is force divided by area, where our force is our 570 newtons, and the area of our snowshoe is 0.15, which gives me 3,800 pascals. Doing the same for our walking shoe, our weight is the same, but our area is now 0.03, and that gives me 19,000 pascals. Explain why using snowshoes makes it easier to walk in the soft snow. And so the key thing we've shown is that because the walking shoe has a much smaller area, it exerts a much greater pressure on the snow. What that means is that the walking shoe is going to sink a lot further than the snowshoe. So let's write that. While both shoe types exert the same force on the snow, 570 newtons, the snowshoe has a much greater area. It therefore exerts less pressure on the snow and sinks less. Question 2. Pete and Manaya have decided to climb down a rope into a cave. Pete and his climbing equipment have a mass of 80 kilograms. Calculate the weight of Pete and his climbing equipment. And so our force of gravity, which is our weight, is equal to the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, g. Scrolling up here, you'll see that we're given a g value of 10 newtons per kg. So we can put our numbers in, which gives us 800 newtons. Using Pete as an example, explain the difference between mass and weight. 
If there's one question you need to go into this exam knowing how to answer 100%, it's the difference between mass and weight. Pete's mass is a measure of how much material he is made of. His weight is the force of gravity on this mass. When Manaya is 100 meters from the bottom of the cave, her 1 kg torch falls out of her backpack. Calculate the gravitational potential energy the torch has 100 meters above the ground. Our equation for gravitational potential energy is given to us right here. Where our mass is our 1 kilogram, our acceleration due to gravity is our 10, which we used last question, and the height is our 100 meters which gives us a thousand joules. What type of energy does the torch gain as it falls? Which is of course kinetic energy. Calculate the maximum speed at which her torch will hit the ground. Air resistance can be ignored, thank God. And so to find the speed, we're going to need the kinetic energy, which we can solve for V by first multiplying both sides by two, dividing both sides by M, and finally square rooting both sides, and also swapping the sides around. Now we have the mass, but we don't actually know the kinetic energy yet. Or do we? So in our situation, we have the torch is falling from our height of 100 meters, and as it does so, it begins with a gravitational potential energy of 1000 joules, but then as it falls, that energy is converted into our kinetic energy. Right at the bottom before it hits the ground, all of this 1000 joules is going to be converted into kinetic energy, because our air resistance can be ignored, which means that our kinetic energy is in fact our gravitational potential energy, which we've already found to be 1000 joules. So we now have everything for our calculation. Which gives me 44.7 meters per second. Question C. To get out of the cave, they need to climb up a 170 meter rope. Pete, with a mass of 80 kgs, takes 2,200 seconds. Manaya, mass 75 kgs, takes 2,000 seconds. Calculate the work done by both Pete and Manaya. So let's start with Pete. Our equation for work is force times distance, where our force is gravitational and can be found by multiplying their mass by the acceleration due to gravity. So we can substitute mg for f. Putting our numbers in. Which gives me 136,000 joules. Let's now do the same for Monaya. Our work is our mgd as we found earlier. Using her mass instead of Pete's. Gives me 127,500 joules. Calculate the power output by both Pete and Monaya. And we'll start with Pete again. Our power is our work divided by time, where Pete's work is 136,000, and Pete's time is our 2,200 seconds, which gives me 68.1 watts. Let's do the same for Manaya. Once again, our power is work over time. Manaya's work was 127,500, and her time was 2,000 seconds, which gives me 63.8 watts. Explain who does more work, and also who uses more power. And so we can see that Pete does more work, because 136,000 is bigger than 127,500, but we see that his power is less than Manaya's. The reason his power is less is because he spends his work over a larger time. So let's write that. Pete does more work as he has more mass, but uses less power as he takes longer to climb. Question 3. Dragsters are designed to travel short distances very quickly. Below is a speed time graph of a dragster. Question A. What is the maximum speed of the dragster? And since our speed is on our y-axis here, we can see that the maximum value is 200 meters per second. Using the graph, show the acceleration of the dragster in the first 4 seconds is 50 meters per second per second. To do that, we need our change in time, which is four seconds. And as we looked at in the previous question, our change in velocity is 200 meters per second. The equation we use is that the acceleration equals change in velocity divided by time, which is 200 divided by four, and therefore 50 meters per second per second. 
The mass of the dragster is 1050 kilograms. Calculate the net force required to accelerate the dragster at 50 meters per second per second. So we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Our mass is 1050. Our acceleration is 50, which gives me 52,500 newtons. On the diagram below, draw and label arrows to show the size and direction of the vertical and horizontal forces on the dragster as it accelerates in section A. And so, what a shame we don't have our picture of our dragster, but don't worry, I have this covered. Now, if we scroll up and look at our section A, we see that in section A, the dragster is accelerating. That means it has a forward force that is greater than its force backwards. So we can imagine a forward thrust force, and that must be overcoming, so it must be greater than the backwards force, which we know must be there, which is our force of friction. Now, for the vertical direction, we know the forces must be balanced. We know that because the dragster is not flying into the sky and it's not digging itself into the ground. So we'll have a downwards force of gravity, which will be the same size as our upwards normal force, which you could also call the support force or the reaction force. And so the key part of this question is that you get the labels reasonably correct. Some substitutions can be accepted, such as drag instead of friction. The other thing is that you get the proportions correct relative to each other. That is that the normal force and the gravity force are the same size, and that the thrust force must be greater than the friction force. We're now asked to do the same for section C. Let me substitute our dragster again. And if we scroll up to section C, we see that the speed of the dragster is decreasing which means that the backwards force, the drag force or the friction force must be greater than the frontwards thrust force in opposite to our previous question. And our vertical forces will be the same as the previous example, equal and opposite. Question C, dragsters use a parachute to slow them down. Allow me to illustrate. Using the graph below, compare the size and direction of the net force in section A with section C. No calculations are required. Now it's important to note that the slope on a speed time graph is the acceleration. And so we see that our slope here is very steep, so we have a large acceleration. Whereas over here, we see that we have a gentler slope, which means we have a smaller acceleration. And specifically, it is a deceleration. The speed is decreasing. And as for the force, as we're accelerating, there'll be a speed in, say, the forward direction, and the acceleration will be adding to that speed. It will be in the same direction. However, in our section C, we have our speed in our forward direction, but this time we're decelerating, which means that we are accelerating opposite to that speed. And since our acceleration direction is the same as our force direction, that means in section A, our force is forwards with the velocity, and in section C, it's against the velocity. So let's write that down. But before I do, let me just actually be clear. As we mentioned here, the acceleration in our section A is going to be greater than our section C, and thus, as will our force. The speed change in both sections is the same, however in section A it changes in a shorter time. This means the acceleration and therefore force must be larger. In section A the car accelerates, which means its net force is with the velocity. In section C it decelerates, so the net force is against the velocity. And we're done.